Good evening, everyone. I would like to call to order uh, the City Commission meeting. Today is Monday, December 12th, 2022, and the time is 5 uh, p.m. We will start this meeting off as we do all of our City Commission meetings uh, with um, a moment of silence. And during this holiday season, uh, it is uh, not as happy and joyful for all of us. Uh, so I would just ask you to consider those who are uh, less fortunate uh, during this time, uh, during this moment of silence. Madam President, can you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Let me state uh, the rules of civility and decorum that govern uh, this meeting. Officials shall be recognized by the chair and shall not interrupt the speaker. Public comment shall be addressed to the city commission as a whole and not to any individual in the dais or in the audience. Displays of anger, rudeness, ridicule, impatience, lack of respect, and personal attacks are strictly prohibited. Unauthorized remarks from the audience, stamping of feet, whistles, yells, and similar demonstrations should not be permitted. Please govern yourselves accordingly as offenders may be removed from the meeting. Madam City Administrator, are there any additions, lesions, reorganization of the agenda? Mr. Mayor, no additions or deletions, but I would like to remind the board uh, that there will not be a quorum for your December 27th meeting. And under the city code, uh, the board has to take formal action to cancel that meeting. And you have to do that tonight. All right. Um, before we move into the rest of the agenda, uh, commissioners, why don't we go ahead and address that item okay, so it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. Uh, I will entertain a motion. Mayor, I move to cancel our uh, December 27th meeting due to a lack of quorum. Very good. Uh, it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, it's been seconded. S several seconds squared. But anyway, <laughs> um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed, like sign. Okay. Uh, so the uh, motion carries unanimously, and the December 27th meeting is canceled due to lack of a quorum. All right. Uh, we will now move uh, to the consent calendar, item 6.1 through. 6.8, it appears. Um, commissioners, any comment, questions on consent? All right. Um, anything in the portal, Madam Clerk? No, Mr. Mayor. All right, and I don't have any cards, so I will entertain a motion. Mayor, I move to approve consent. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed like sign. Hearing no opposition, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. <laughs> Item 7.1, resolution number 224-22, approves an agreement with RUD One Flagler LLC for the acceptance of the large-scale public art installation portals by Fred Eversley as an addition to the city's public art collection and to be installed in the open public space at One Flagler. Uh, Mayor, Sibile. Commissioners, Sibile Welter, Administrator of Public Art and Culture. Do you want to do it with me, Bill? You want to do it? You want me to do it? Okay. I was seeing if I had a partner in this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a another public-private partnership uh, with the city's Art Life Program, and the city and uh, related group, as well as the CRA, and bringing a renowned artist, Fred Eversley. So I'm going to go briefly. Um, this was workshopped. So I'm going to go briefly through, just as a reminder of some of his work. This is an artist that was part of the Light and Space movement. Um, he has been dedicated to his art practice for over 50 years. And uh, through it, he uses art and science to bring optical, what he calls uh, kinetic effects, into his structures. 
that bring in light. And uh, one of the key things for him is that the viewer, as they experience his work, uh, feel the energy and the reflection upon themselves. And so what he has... Billy, can you hold just a second? Sure. We're having some technical difficulties up on the dais. Okay. No and everyone can't see the uh, presentation. Put you back here so you can look at the art. Are you on? Well, it's not fair. How long will it be? Okay, uh, proceed, I guess the commissioner can see up there. I'm sorry for that. All good? Okay. So, um, so Mr. Eversley is focusing on a specific shape for what would be coming into uh, one flagler. So as I said, what, a lot of his, um, his sculptures and his interactive sculptures deal with the light and reflection, and this is something, again, that he's been working on for 50 years. And he uh, uses different uh, shapes in order to achieve his goal. And so you can see the progress of his work over a span of time. And for one flagler, he was very site specific. So he um, looked at the site and was given uh, a certain amount of information about it. And one very important factor was Julian Abels, who was the architect uh, not on file at the time, but later be became the architect on file for the first Ch Church of Christ that sits on the site. And here is a rendering of the future context of what one flagger would look like with the church in the background. And so he, this is sort of his mind working, and I'm just going to read this to you because I think what he wrote in this tells a lot about his thinking process. Layers of iterations in search for the strongest concept of the most significant scheme, the simplest means yet most impactful appearance, with a natural placement and shape from multiple sight lines, given a sense that the portals belongs to the past, like a gate that was once part of the original master plan by Abel's before the future layers, but now rises again, reemerging to a new beginning. And so what he is proposing are eight portals that rise, leading visitors to the heart of the site's historical ground. These arch sculptures make a majestic gesture, connecting the past and the future with an illuminated presence. These portals single a new beginning, an eternal light of infinite spirit. And so here we have it, the eight portals that reflect the eight columns of Abel's church. And then you'll see um, there'll be Two texts, mess, two texts from William Blake that he uses predominantly throughout his work. And I'm just going to go through uh, several renderings that uh, the artist has provided so that you get different angles of what it would look like during the day. And then we'll get into the night as well. And they're quite stunning, so you can see that. And what's interesting about what Mr. Eversley has proposed also on these sculptures is that they, so there'll be five on the water, one on land, and two on the grass, but they're actually all the same height on the top, so there'll be 16 feet, five inches, um, so the top level is, is the exact same amount of height. And these are the two, um, he has suggested these two specific quotes from William Blake that you saw in the earlier photos <coughs> that will be uh, placed on the seating area. And so the Art Life Committee is recommending to City Commission because uh, they reviewed Section 78.125 of the Code of Ordinances. Mr. Eversley is a renowned artist um, and he will be bringing a sensory experience and a phenomena to the viewer. It complies with the master plan, and this is a very site-specific, large-scale installation that, again, pays homage to Julian Abel's architecture. The work is contemporary, but is influenced by the history of the church and its architects. 
The cultural significance cannot be understated. This is a distinct cultural experience that is being brought to this community. Um, the quality are very durable. It's appropriate to the site and public gesture of celebration and acceptance and encouraging a communal experience. It will bring diversity to the city's public art collection in terms not only of media and innovation, but of creativity by a seasoned artist who's highly respected in, for his contributions to, to the field of visual arts. It's not detrimental to the public welfare. The maintenance will be maintained by the city's art life program. This is separate from the city's general fund. There's a separate um, account for maintenance, restoration, and repair. And the value, the 1% has been escrowed, and the value of this piece will probably most likely um, go over the 2.1 million that is put on here. And the artist, I've already said, um, is so well known that it will, he will draw local, national, and inter international interest. And the budget has been set aside as well for 250000 coming from the Art Life account towards this public private partnership. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, commissioners, any questions, comments? All right. Commissioner Lambert. Thank you so much. I'm just excited to see so much public art on today's commission agenda. So thank you. This is a beautiful concept and great to see it finally come to fruition. Just um, wanted to thank Gopal and Related. Um, I had the chance, I don't know if anybody else had the chance to attend um, it was a day of art, and it was about, uh, Sibile, you were there, of course, about public art, and we had the chance to hear three different um, speakers talk from their perspective, an artist, someone who um, helped with public-private partnerships in Denver, and then the public art administrator from the city of New York. And what we're doing here in West Palm Beach, it may seem like, you know, it's just, um, we're dabbling in art now, but it is um, really instrumental in helping to make our city great. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who contributes to that and, and that this city has leadership um, towards adding more public art. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner uh, Warren. I'd just like to say that I, I attended several presentations with Mr. Eversley, and it was a pleasure. He is certainly well known and respected in the art world, and it is fantastic that he's completing this installation that will go at one of Flagler. So I would also like to say that it's a tremendous job. Kudos to you, Sibile, and the Art Life uh, commi um, Committee, yes. and uh, to the developers for the work that was done and the thought that was put into this. It is, it is beautiful. Yeah, this will be an iconic piece of art for our city. People uh, will perhaps even come to our city to see this particular installation. I'm very excited about it. Any other questions? Uh, President Fox. Thank you. I would like to also say thank you to the team that brought this to us. It was, I loved having the opportunity to um, speak with Mr. Eversley at that workshop and hear a little bit about what goes into his um, designs and, and thought process and especially how specific he was to this concept. Um, I live across the street from 360 Rosemary. I often see people just stopping in front to look at the artwork and I'm sure that will be the same case here. So thank you all, this is really beautiful. Very good. Any other uh, questions, comments? Anything in the portal? No, Mr. Mayor. Clerk? All right, very much. Very good. I will entertain a motion. Mayor, I move to approve resolution number 224-22. The proposed public art concept is for one Flagler at South Flagler Drive. This motion is based on the findings that the proposed artwork meets the criteria set forth in section 78-125 of the city code as reviewed by the Art Life West Palm Beach Committee. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed like sign. Hearing no opposition, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We will now I'll turn to item 7.2. Resolution number 300-22 grants face of the city approval for a large scale sculpture titled Genius Loci by artist Nikisha Durrett to be installed at Heart and Soul Park 
Allocation of $300,000 was approved through resolution number 44-22F and resolution number 286-21. Mayor, Commissioner Sibylle Welter, Minister of Public Art and Culture, um, I am happy to let you know that Nikisha Durrett, who's a Washington-based artist, flew in today so she could present to all of you. Um, I did ask her to reduce it from the community one, which was well received, um, it, but you know it was longer. So I'm going to hand it over to her, and then I will bring you the findings of the Art Life Committee. Hello, everyone. I'm Nikisha Durrett. As uh, Sibele said, I'm from Washington, D.C. On a personal note, Fred Eversley is one of my heroes, so it's quite an honor to present my work <laughs> following him. Um, My practice is very uh, research-based, um, so I always like to start presentations with, um, with these two images. These are photos of my mom and dad, and um, obviously these are photos from their wedding day. And these photos sat on our coffee table for years, and um, I knew that they were married uh, in Washington, D.C., um, in April of 1968, and it wasn't until years later, um, just because I was kind of poking around and asking questions and um, had some awareness about myself, and I had the added context of knowing that just 14 days before they were married, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and that um, this was the view on their ride to the chapel um, in the back seat of my grandfather's car. Um, so, you know, I always had these beautiful pictures on the table, but didn't have the full context of the day um, and what was happening around that time. And after I had that information, um, it brought into sharpness um, technicolor clarity, um, just the nature of my parents' relationship, and also um, their resilience, a quiet resilience that, um, you know, in the face of everything that was happening, that there was still beauty and that they were still determined to uh, cement their love. This is um, a project that I am currently in working on right now in Arlington, Virginia. Um, it's on the campus of a Fortune 20 company who is opening a second headquarters in Arlington. Um, just like my other projects, this is a, was a very research-based pro project where um, I researched the history of Arlington and discovered that um, before 1941, there existed a self-sustaining black community that was forced to relocate in 1941 for the construction of the Pentagon. Not many people know about this history in Washington, D.C., in Virginia, um, not even, in some cases, people who live in Arlington do not know about this history of this town called Queen City. So one of the things that I like to do is to make things um, very big so that they can't be missed. Oftentimes, histories are overlooked. And I like to um, sometimes place unusual objects in un un unexpected places. So in this case, um, I'm building a 35-foot tall um, brick structure that is occupiable, and you can actually walk inside. And when you're inside, you're looking up at 903 ceramic vessels that are handmade by black ceramicists from, that I'm commissioning from around the country. And each one of those 903 vessels represents one of the um, black women, men, and children who were displaced. So this is a gesture toward bringing that community back together. There are 
several youngsters, uh, well, they were young at the time, and they're now in their 80s and 90s, and they were interviewed and asked, what do they most miss about, um, about Queen City, and what do they remember most? And um, what they miss most and what they remember is their community. When this community was displaced, they lost everything. So that brings us here to West Palm Beach, to Genius Loci. Um, very similar story of displacement lies at the root of, um, of this story. The word genius loci um, actually means spirit of a place. I was thinking about that word genius and thinking about um, this community um, that, um, that resides around uh, Heart and Soul Park and around the Sunset Lounge. And that word genius and how we choose who deserves that kind of designation and, and who doesn't. Um, and so genius, the original meaning of it, actually goes back to um, a Latin meaning, which means spirit of a place. And um, it's an ancient word that describes the way that everything meets in a particular place, the way a stream is positioned, the way the wind blows, the way the air smells. Um, so if we were to actually assign similar meaning to that word genius as it relates to people, actually we all possess genius. And genius is the way that everything meets in us, the way that um, our ancestors' struggles and histories all meet within us. This is a quote from Sarah Zodi, who was a black landscape architect. As black people in America, we are walking through this world knowing that places have these histories. Being gaslit by what we see in the physical world is exhausting. What would it feel like for the environment to reaffirm what you know about the history of this place? So here we ha have here in the background um, is a historic photo of some of those uh, shotgun houses that we saw earlier. Um, and these are the shotgun houses that existed in the sticks where um, the uh, descendants um, the descendants of folks who are from the sticks currently live in the area where this artwork is going to be positioned. And when I first visited um, this community, I was taken to the sticks promenade. And some of the shotgun houses had just been refurbished, renovated. And I entered one of the structures, and in the middle there was a heap of, of wood that was um, that was kind of left over from one of the um, one of the homes, and I felt this magnetic pull to that wood. And <clears throat> at the time, I didn't know why. I didn't know a lot about shotgun houses. When I was eight years old, I went to New Orleans um, during the World's Fair. And we had a tour guide who took us to a shotgun house and said, it's called a shotgun house because everybody knows why. And that was all I knew about shotgun houses until I started to research this place. And what I discovered is that the shotgun house is a vernacular architecture to West Africa. Never knew that. And here's an actual photograph of um, a so-called shotgun house. But we see here that there's um, a Yoruba word, togan, which means gathering place, and shogun, meaning God's house. 
And this is actually where the word sh shotgun house comes from. So that architecture, those architectural plans were actually carried within the bodies of enslaved people across the Atlantic to the Caribbean and to um, the southern portions of the United States. And that's how we have shotgun architecture. And these are migrants who came to um, the region to build um, Flag Flagler's Railroad, the hotels that they built, and their own homes in the sticks, which after everything was built in Palm, in Palm Beach, um, there was no longer a need for these black individuals. And so they were forced away using eminent domain. And it's rumored that there were fires in the sticks and the fire department wasn't putting them out. And so there's all this lore, um, stories that get passed down. And because no one was really keeping records of this removal, it's thrown into speculation. But the residents, the folks, they know the truth. And this was a quote from Richard Riles, who said, the historical society has a yeoman's task to convince us that the version that the African-American community has of what happened is different. There is probably somewhere in between the Palm Beach County Historical Society's version of events and the African-American lore of events. The truth is somewhere in between. So you can take it how you found, find it. And this is how I found it. What West Palm Beach had in material wealth, sorry, what Palm Beach had in material wealth, West Palm Beach had in heart, soul, and genius. And I love this photograph of Lionel Hampton at the Sunset Lounge. Sunset Lounge is a cultural equator. Um, there are many spaces that I think um, are sites of black sites of liberation. Um, Duke Ellington was someone who performed at the Sunset Lounge. And um, he wrote a song called The Harlem Air Shaft, where he was talking about the inner lives of black people and how if you put your ear up to an air shaft, you could hear, you could smell what people were having for dinner, you could hear couples fighting, or you could hear people laughing. But so much goes on in an air shaft. And I think of the Sunset Lounge as one of these um, sites of liberation where black people could just be, where they could exist without, um, without being surveilled. They could be truly themselves and express their genius. Um, so thinking about this particular time period of the, the heyday of the Sunset Lounge, I began to look at um, loudspeakers the way that Duke Ellington referenced the loudspeaker, um, the, the air shaft as a loudspeaker. Um, and I thought about that loudspeaker, and if it were in front of the, the Sunset Lounge, what would we hear? If it were pointed at the ground and the ancestors could, their voices could ring out through this loudspeaker, you know, what would they have to say? So I was looking at the sh various shapes of speakers modern speakers to the old-time gramophone speaker. And I arrived at this shape, which is a gramophone-like um, gramophone speaker that is pointed toward the ground and aiming up at the sky. And inside of it, there is a mirror, a backlit mirror, so that one could see themselves in the present moment, but also 
um, uh, suggested that they could hear, experience uh, the ancestors communing. This is a copper structure. It's about 10 feet in diameter. Here's our Sunset Lounge. Here it is in position. Um, one feature that I think is really awesome is that um, the, the piece is going to exist on a deconstructed uh, plinth that will be made of black concrete that will be um, formed using um, charred wood so that it will have the appearance of charred wood so that it will almost look like um, those, those boards from, uh, from the shotgun homes that have, been, that have been burned. And there's an interesting thing about, about burned wood or about wood and construction in general um, wood actually has a higher fire rating than steel because steel buckles under heat. And when wood gets burned, it actually gets stronger, which is a great metaphor, I think. And you can see here in these drawings um, that deconstructed plinth. Uh, the materials, there's copper sheeting um, with a embossed uh, diamond pattern just to reference um, roof shingles and the uh, charred wood. And just for A little video here. All right. No video today. <laughs> All right, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very insightful. Yes. Uh, looking forward to viewing uh, the results of your creativity. Uh, any questions or comments, commissioners? All right, uh, Sabili, was that the end of your presentation as well, or do you have more? Um, no, sir, I was uh, just gonna say that the Art Life Committee unanimously voted to recommend, um, after reviewing section 78125, that it meets all the criteria um, for Nikisha Durrett's uh, Genius Loci. Very good. Um, President Fox and then Commissioner Lambert. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you. I'm really looking forward to this. I had the opportunity to, to meet Nikisha a couple of times um, at the Heart and Soul Park and also at the Sunset Lounge. And I think you mentioned that Mr. Ever Eversley is one of your heroes, and I think that you probably are a hero to many. Um, people were just captivated listening to your presentation. I think it's so exciting for the neighborhood, and I'm really excited that you had the chance to be here tonight to um, show us more. So I'm looking forward to, to all of this um, just coming to fruition, and thank you for coming to present. Commissioner Lambert. Thank you. I also wanted to thank Mr. Rett for coming here today and for giving us such a great thorough presentation. It's always wonderful to hear the story behind what inspired the artist. Um, Sibile, I had a question just related to the maintenance of that area. It, it looked like the grass that was there was maybe some natural, um, it doesn't need to be maintained a whole lot grass, but I just wanted to make sure that it's maintained so that we can effectively see and appreciate the art that's there. Is that included in the um, ongoing maintenance of this project? So this particular piece as well as uh, actually all tonight is um, we're in partnership with the CRA. So we are working out, I will, you know, the Art Life Committee will take care of all the maintenance that's directly related to the actual sculpture and everything surrounding uh, will work out with the CRA. But we'll make sure it's maintained well so that it looks at its best all the time. And just to follow up, if I could, yes. 
related to the mirror that's inside. Will that need to be polished or cleaned, or is it of a material that can withstand the weather elements? It will, it, it will be uh, needed to be polished, but not like you would in your house, not that kind of mirror. Great. Thank you. Look forward to seeing it. Any other questions on the dais? Uh, Madam City Clerk, do we have anything uh, on the portal? No, Mr. Mayor. Very good. Uh, then I will entertain a motion. Mayor, I move to approve resolution number 300-22. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed like sign. Hearing no opposition, motion carries unanimously. Thank you again, Mr. Rep. Look forward to working with you. <coughs> Item 7.3, resolution number 301-22, Grants face of the city approval for the artwork in Northwood Village titled Voices in Northwood by local artist Ates Isladak and Prismatic Tessellations by local artist Molly Aubrey to be installed in the Northwood, Northwood Village area in Bloom Park. Totally allocated approved project budget is $60,000. Uh, hello again. So this is another partnership with the CRA. Um, we, the Art Life uh, committee was asked to um, figure out a way to create a walkable public art experience um, for the merchant areas and to anchor it between the two parks. And so we identified two local artists that both these artists, by the way, either have work in the Northwood Village area or have a studio there. So they're very familiar with the area. And when they came to present uh, the Art Life Committee suggested that they collaborate because their pieces um, sort of melded in very well together. So Molly, who will be speaking first, um, has a sculpture background, and Ates, who will be speaking next, he is actually a filmmaker but has a lot of sound um, in his art, and so this will actually be the first sound installation as well. So, hand it over. Hi everyone, my name is Molly Aubrey and thank you City Life for inviting me um, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my work with you. It's really an honor. Okay, so I have a studio in Northwood and in 2020 I converted a warehouse into my studio where I create my work and also host workshops. I, and for the last two years I've also been teaching as an adjunct professor at the New World School of the Arts in Miami, so I wanted to share some of my student work just to contextualize my practice. I actually grew up here in Palm Beach County, and while I left for college, uh, graduate school, residencies, and teaching opportunities, the light, color, and uh, textures that are local to South Florida really inspire my work. Okay. So I'm pretty new to public art, but I just very recently installed this which was commissioned by the Miami-Dade Department of Cultural Affairs. And this work was inspired by bioluminescence, the glowing algae in waters off of the coasts here in Florida. Um, the work in the foreground in this photo is by another artist, Anastasia Samoylova. And to me, these works reference sort of mysterious planets or images of you know, ocean water viewed through a microscope. But the intention of this installation is to create a meditative place where people can rest and communicate and, um, and just share space together. So my background originally is in painting, printmaking, and graphic design. And in a lot of my two-dimensional works, I'll combine those processes, like in these two works, which were a part of my thesis exhibition at the Cranbrook Art Museum. <laughs> It's another um, two-dimensional work. Uh, but a few years ago, I started to move away from two dimensions into three, uh, which I started with this small piece. And this is another early work where I started to do that, where I just installed a two-dimensional print into the nearby architecture, in this case, a radiator. And I also started to use light. Just another installation. And I've also started working on this series of pyramids where I have folded my two-dimensional works into three dimensions in pyramids. 
And then for some of these works, I started, instead of just using printed imagery, I started physically applying many layers of graphite into these forms that are geometric, but don't really, I don't really have a name for the shape. And they naturally started climbing up the walls of my studio. Here's one of them in my studio in Northwood and another. And when Sibylle came to my studio uh, for a visit about a year ago, we were talking about just how we could both really imagine these outside, like crawling up the side of a building, maybe made out of metal. And so I was really thrilled when she asked me to prepare um, this, uh, some, a concept for this project here in Northwood, which is my community. So I sent out a survey to the local community, to business owners and mm -hmm. residents, and some of the language that uh, the community used to describe itself as colorful, artistic, funky, water, and materials were um, glass and steel. And I've seen these reflected around um, in the architecture. So for my project, um, I was inspired by Northwood's unique history, architecture, local flora, and um, I wanted to create sort of unexpected moments throughout Northwood Village. And instead of just working purely with metal, I'll insert um, some glass into some of the, the planes and they'll be backlit through a solar powered LED to cast light onto the neighborhood at, at night. So like Sibylle mentioned, Atesh and I would be collaborating and these sculptures would be installed throughout the village, encouraging visitors and residents to sort of wander off of just, uh, instead of just sticking to Northwood Road, you know, there are a lot of really interesting spaces around the community. So we wanted to start with Blum Park and then have a few other locations as well, like the walkway to Northwood Court, toward the entrance to Northwood Village near Cafe mm -hmm. Centro, in front of my new old chair, and also in front of the Palm Beach Opera and in Serenity Park, but we're open to you know, altering these. And here are just some digital sketches of what these might look like installed throughout the community. The materials I would use would be cold rolled steel, fused glass, and then solar powered LEDs. And I have identified local collaborators um, and fabricators who work with these materials. The total budget from my half, this is just a preliminary budget of 30,000. And um, if Atesh has any leftover funds, we can use them toward making the sculptures larger. I'll make them as, as large as I can afford to. Uh, but this is what it would look like with the 30. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Um, questions from commission? Commissioner Warren? What are some of the dimensions of the pieces? Well, I know when we originally spoke about them, we thought that it was very um, unique, but how do we make sure that people notice them, that they're visible and that? Um, Absolutely, I, that's a great question. Um, around this size, I would say, I, I think um, most of them will be around this size. Some of them, the simpler forms might be closer to this size. Um, but again, I'll make them as large as the budget allows. I have, a, I have a cup question for Sibylle. Mm -hmm. Sibylle, about three feet and two feet, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Originally, we talked about um, the the continuity and the the sculptures going throughout the entire community. And I know we're starting in one area. Yeah. Um, is there any consideration that is going into how we would be able to uh, make this more robust so that people can actually see? this trail of the artwork and the connectivity? You mean going beyond the six sites? Yes. So um, what we want to do first is do the six sites to see how it flows. And then you know the CRA again and I, we would sit down and go, OK, this is really working. Let's put more money into this budget and spread it out. But we're, this, is per, this is an experiment. I'm not, you know, we all know that we're experimenting with two things, putting uh, sculpture on light posts in different areas and also bringing in a sound component. So yes, we're open to that. 
first we'd like to get these six up and running. Can you talk a little bit about the maintenance and the, the, the sound component? Um, do you want to hear the sound first? Sure. Okay, let's do that first. Uh, the maintenance right now, so this is a semi-permanent. We're not going to go beyond five years. Again, we're kind of playing. Um, but again, the maintenance, uh, anything that has to be maintained, again, is through the Art Life program. Let me get his up and running. Now, is there a separate presentation from the sound artist? Uh, well, yes. Okay. Well, that's. Yes. Um, well, no, they're together, though. The I, I know, I know, but oh. does he have yes, a presentation of right his now. component? His, uh, his do we have any other questions for the visual artist at the, or sculpture? Commissioner Lambert. Thank you. I was just curious about the rolled steel. Like, is that pretty sturdy? Mm -hmm. And so. Rain, wind comes, it's not going to deform it. Okay, mm -hmm. great, thank you. Okay, yeah, okay. Well, now we'll turn to the sound component. So, yeah, so you're going to use this here. And just if you can get to the sound part, I'll help you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Atesh Izzeldak. Uh, I am a resident of Northwood. Uh, my project is called Voices of Northwood, and I'm very excited to be able to work and install something in the place that I live. The concept of this is to auditorily personify six locations within the designated eight blocks in Northwood Village. Each location will have a speaker playing a unique composition, a composition name, and a sign and element. Uh, this can also tie into um, the way that we're trying to get people to move through the location. So with our QR code, a map, uh, we can let you know someone that comes across the first one know that there are other ones to go see. Um, the compositions will be created from traditional song elements such as guitar, keys, bass, drums, horns, but supplemented with recorded found local sound within Northwood. And examples are birds chirping, basketball sounds, tennis sounds, people talking, feet walking, train, train tracks, street musicians, glasses clinking, etc. Uh, incorporating these sounds into songs, ambient meditations, chill hip hop, dreamy blues, the music will physically exist in these unique locations, but also include an interactive element such as a QR code so that people can find out more about the project, but also share the track with a friend. So I'm hoping for a, a way that people can experience this and send it to someone that, to listen to, but also to come experience in person. Uh, I'm not going to go over what this is everything about associative music, but uh, the idea is to basically the everyday sounds that we hear, like I mentioned, dogs, cats, bikes, trains, these come to evoke certain feelings for us and working these into song compositions that are unique to Northwood and there are a lot of sounds unique to Northwood but there's also a lot of cultures unique to Northwood. Um, there's like a Turkish restaurant there, there's an Italian restaurant, there's um, you know Patank has reggae nights every Friday and it's like there's just so much different culture and community that are always mingling, but sometimes also staying separate and working kind of different cultures, musics into the sonic compositions as well as the sounds found throughout um, just nature. Uh, this is me recording sounds in Northwood, and I'm going to I'm going to play a minute long sample of a work in progress called uh, Northwood Scenes. Um, view I just click this link. And hopefully we can get to a video. Yeah, just, yeah. just click it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> this might be the whole two-minute composition. But there you go. Yeah, you had it. Okay.
that's just one of six compositions that I'm working on. The materials, uh, weatherproof custom speakers, amp and cable enclosures, audio timer and looper, uh, and signage. So these are ways to have these existing without any maintenance for as long as possible. They're insured for five years by the company creating them and installing them, but they're, the intention is to have them set and running on a timer and needing no you know, human interaction to go. And so six different speakers with six different um, unique compositions, signage in place so that people can share and find a map and find the other locations. And my budget here, again, is based off the 30000 which is 60000 for the whole project with Molly and I. Um, so um, there's a breakdown there. I, I'm happy to send that for further review. And Molly and I just discussed that if there's any room after the fabrication of my project that I would uh, help her compose bigger pieces of her project. And um, we're also hoping to have our pieces as kind of a dialogue with one another. So my pieces kind of existing as the audio component to her visual and her visuals being the, uh, well, just vice versa what I said. Uh, so, you know, a way to experience the sound and see a piece that maybe has certain colors and feels and shape that add to the sonic composition and the other way around. So. And these are the locations that Molly already presented. So. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. And this is all original composition? Or all yes. the music is all original? all original music and sound recorded by me out in the world. And it'll play on a loop or is it activated by motion? I wish I could have figured out the motion component, and I'm still working on that, but as of now, a loop, and it's sort of certain times in the day, I'm thinking more, you know, uh, kind of starting mid-morning and ending somewhere in the evening, so as not to get in the way of the music that exists throughout Northwood in the evening times. But also, uh, the volumes uh, will be set in such a way that you experience it really if you want to experience it as in you get close enough to the installation to hear it rather than it's driving a store owner crazy <laughs> after a year of being on a loop sure. to there yes great thank you questions uh, commissioner Peduzzi. thank you it's it's definitely a, a unique um, concept and i'm happy to see that you're working together with the visual artists to you know complement each other's work um, my understanding, if I understood it correctly, is each location will have its own uh, unique uh, composition and that will hopefully complement the artwork. How long will that loop be before it replays? Each composition will be between two and five minutes and there will be some kind of maybe like an intro and outro that's quiet enough that it's almost like no music in leading back to, but it's it's almost like an infinite loop. So something like if, if a piece was five minutes long, you would experience it, and then after a short period of time, it would repeat itself. And do you have an idea of the decibels that will be emitted from, from the speakers? I, I haven't tested, and I the company making them is a very professional sound company, so I think they can make it so it is deafeningly loud, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going with uh, you know the levels of probably just around like 20, 30 dB at most. So something, again, that you can just experience if you stand close enough to experience it, but also hear all the frequencies, the low end, the mids, and the highs. And one more follow-up. Yes. Will we be able to see the speakers themselves, and at what height will they be placed? I actually had uh, samples here. Um, so it's, it's kind of this shape, the, the one we're looking at here. So they're a little over a, a foot high and just probably eight inches in depth and width. And um, they can be in any color, so that we might work that out so that they, again, complement uh, what Molly is working on. or if we want to go the route that they're kind of more hidden with and using the color of where they'll be next to or attached to. So, yeah. 
Any other questions? Commissioner Warren and then Commissioner Lambert. Hi, I appreciate your artistic approach to sound in the community. I'd just like to clarify that you're not utilizing sounds of sirens in your well, I, I mean, I, it's everything I hear I'm, and I'm inspired by, I would be interested to use if there was something that felt like it was off the table or off limits, I'm happy to hear about that. But I think, you know, any song, I mean, to me, the, the one that I just played is a pretty uplifting piece. And I think between the six pieces, there will be some that are uplifting and maybe some that are more contemplative. And, you know, the siren sound in that song, to me, doesn't evoke anything negative but maybe it did to you so it's something to consider but um yeah to me it's just really it's not part of my composition All right, ladies and gentlemen, we need to vacate the, the room and this meeting is adjourned until we resume after the uh, siren.